All right. I guess we'll start. Um, as you know, we lost last week because of the weather, right? Because it was pretty crappy. Um, visibility was pretty shoddy at best. I thought I was going to lose Thursday, too, because the drive from Aurelia to here on Thursday, there was about four-foot distance between you and the car in front of you. But I came to Barry, went to work, just drove it, took it really easy. And then in Barry, you guys were, like, nice and bright and sunny. Completely opposite to all the areas around you. <laughs> but yeah, whatever. That was awesome. Um, so if you didn't watch the YouTube video that was recorded from last week, then today is going to be a bit confusing because you kind of needed that lesson in order to reinforce this lesson. I did post out the announcement that it was important that you watch the YouTube video and, you know, obviously it's up to you to watch it, not me to to give it to you today, because otherwise it would put us behind by a week, <clears throat> which incidentally we're going to lose a week because of family day. Family day falls on a Monday, which means we lose a class that day. Um, because I don't actually get paid to deliver the course for that day either, uh, what you can do is you can watch the, I'm going to take the last lesson that I usually do, and it won't be on the midterm, which is local storage and cookies. I will still deliver the lesson to the Thursday group and record it, and you'll have access to that recording, and you can watch it on YouTube. But you guys will lose that lesson, unfortunately, because of the one lost day. Now, I don't believe Easter Monday falls on April the 22nd, which means you guys should be done by then, because I think you're done the 19th, which means you won't lose a second day. So it's only the one day. I did have a class in the summer. We lost five days. We lost the orientation and four holidays, which was really crappy. Yeah. Anyways, um, so this is week four. This is what you should have covered, hopefully. Um, Watch the YouTube video, did the object literals and constructors lesson, uh, followed along, and then submitted your lab. If you didn't submit your lab, that's okay. I gave you an extra week to submit the lab. I also gave you an extra week to submit the quiz, which means that quiz for week four is due tomorrow by midnight, and the lab is due by next week, Sunday by midnight. Sorry, this week, Sunday by midnight. <clears throat> Plus today's stuff, right? So hopefully you're way ahead of the game and already done. Um, incidentally, I also delivered the assignment in that lesson. So based on the blank expressions, <laughs> there's an assignment that's been delivered. You guys are already a week behind then. Um, we'll talk about it, though, just in a few seconds. Uh, and you know what? Let's talk about it now, actually. We'll talk about it now. Um, let me just open up the... It is in Blackboard. If you go to Assignments in Blackboard, you'll find the PDF up there. This is the PDF that gives you the instructions for it. Basically, you're building a random number game. I've given you a JavaScript like file that has the step by step by step that you can go through and just follow the steps and probably take you maybe two or three hours. You can work in a pair. No more than two people, though. Um, but you can work as a pair and go through and solve all the steps and then submit it. Like I said, it would probably take you about an afternoon to get it all done. <coughs> that being said, though, I usually wind up with people who want to not do my version of it. They want to do their own version of it, and that's totally cool as long as it meets the requirements. Okay? So the requirements are that it has to generate a random number. Um, every single time. Every iteration it has to be a new number. Um, it's very easy to find the random number algorithm. You can find it on MDN if you look up uh, math.random. There's a piece there that tells you how to generate a random number between two numbers. You can literally copy and paste that right directly in the lesson. That's totally fine. I'm not going to nail you for cheating or anything because that's what I did. So <laughs> it's, There's only one way to generate it, so that's the way you're going to generate it. Um, the evaluate guess method, basically you need some sort of functionality that takes the guess from the user through like an input field and then compares that to the random number you generated and returns back whether it's true or false, whether it's been, you know, whether they've guessed correctly. Uh, you need some way to reset the board. So if they guess correctly, the board needs to reset or they need a button to reset the board. Um, they need a hint whether or not their number was lower or higher. And if you want the full marks, you need to do the take it further portion that's inside the outline um, that says you also need to tell them what range 
they're in within 10 numbers each. I'll show you an example in a few seconds. <coughs> and then you need the process guess, which basically takes all of that functionality and encapsulates it in its own function. We unfortunately are not going to get to events before the midterm. So because we're not going to get to events, I've already created the event for you in the file. Um, it's basically just an event bound to a button so that when you click the button, it calls that process guess function for you. If you follow the steps, everything should work. All right, so yes, you may create your own number guessing game from scratch, but it has to meet what's required in the rubric. And yes, you may work in groups of two, only two, okay? Uh, it's very easy, you shouldn't need a bigger group. Only one submission per group, please, and make sure you have a README file. I can't read your mind, I can't guess who your group partner was, and if you come to me three weeks later saying, hey, I worked with so-and-so and you didn't mark my assignment, and there was no README file, then yeah, you're out of luck. So <clears throat> make sure that your partner, whoever's submitting the file, submits a README file with your name in it as well so that you get the marks. Um, also, because this is a very common assignment, it's like so many people do this type of assignment. It's a little different the way I've done it, but not much. Um, code is automatically, I run code against Google. It's very easy. It's very blatant when somebody is cheated because like this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. Oh, here's a big chunk of logic that works and looks like it was completely copy and pasted. And I throw that in Google and in 30 seconds I find the Stack Overflow question it was copied from. So please don't cheat because I will find it and then I zero it out. I just immediately zero out the assignment. There's no going back. You just get zero. This is a hefty assignment because it's 20% of your grade. So to lose that 20% would suck. So don't cheat. This is the rubric that's here. These are the defined functions. If you go out on your own, these functions don't have to have these names. Um, but you do need the functionality. So even if you don't name them that name, they have to have the functionality in the lesson. If you use my file, though, with the steps, please make sure you use those functions. That makes it a lot easier to mark. Um, also will help you out as well because there's, just like our lessons, there's a test script in the background that's actually consistently testing those functions for you and will give you some helpful hints and feedback on each of those functions. So can kind of help you along as you're, as you're progressing through. Uh, and then, so that's 60% for the functionality. <coughs> the game design part is worth 40%. So that's that the game actually works correctly. Um, so for example, if the guess is correct, it resets the guess count, generates a new random number, increments the score by leftover guesses. Uh, if wrong guess provides a hint and decrements the score and the guess count, and then that you've put at least 10% of effort into some styling and made it look, you know, somewhat pretty. I don't know, maybe that's just adding bootstrap or foundation or material design or whatever it is to it to make it look pretty but something that makes it look a little better than the base version. The base version looks like this, so not a lot of styling involved, right? Uh, obviously, you can do some cool things like create like border rounds, background colors, and background images, whatever you want. <coughs> this is basically what the game looks like um, to start when you're finished. Uh, it's called JavaScript Number Guessing Game. You can change the name of it, obviously. Uh, the super awesome guessing number game. Uh, up here is where your message will show, where it says great guess, guess the new number. Uh, and then the score, or sorry, the numbers that, the range that it's between, which is 1 of 100. This is your scoreboard over here. Also, it tells you how many guesses you have left. Next week, we'll be doing the DOM, which will give you everything you need to finally complete this entire thing. The DOM should be the only missing component after today's lesson. So that'll be cool. Okay, so basically, you guess a number. Um, anybody want to give me a number? 42? Why not? It's meaning life, right? Guess 42 is higher than the secret number. You're within 20 of the secret number. So what must the number be between? 22 and 60. 22 and 42. But yeah, close enough. <laughs> Anybody want to give me a number between 22 and 42? Yeah, so it's like you are 30? 20 above then. It's, not like a 20 above. it's, it's higher, so you're within 20 of the secret number. Yeah. 30. It's lower, so it's between, but you're within five of that number, and it's lower, so it's between 30 and 35. 33? Let's do 33. It's higher. 32 or 31, what's it going to be? 31. 31. 
<laughs> oh. There we go. Great number. So basically what it does is it takes the remaining number of guesses and immediately adds it to the score. So if you get it faster, you obviously get a higher score, right? That's the whole concept behind it. I mean, there's some bugginess to it, and you can clean that up because it starts out with the score. So you can clean that up and get rid of those pieces if you wanted to. Uh, or you can literally just go step by step and then add your little bit of CSS to it and call it a day. Probably take you three to four hours with a partner. Not too much work. Depends on you. I don't know how bad your workload is right now based on current classes and current assignments. I'm sure it's not the best. Uh, so when is this due? This is due. Do, 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 if you, is it the 30th? No, 25th. Yeah, February 25th, so quite a ways away. But don't leave it on the back burner forever. <laughs> right? Like, make sure you get to it. Um, yeah, that's basically it in a nutshell. So when you download the student files, just to give you an idea of what you're looking for, you're going to open up the JS file that comes with it. Uh, and that is going to look like this. And you'll see... Starts with step one, write a random number function that requires, returns a value between one and 100, call this function random number. And you just keep going through. You do step two, A, B, C, and D. I think in total there's like, not even 10 steps. Yeah, there's, there's 10 steps exactly actually. 10 steps and then there's like some little micro steps. Whole thing doesn't take very long. In addition, uh, you'll notice there's a little block here that says Sean's code. This thing here will actually provide hints to the console. If you're missing functions or the function isn't operating correctly, it will tell you. So that should be your first point of access to help you figure out what's wrong. Second point of access is where? Where do you get help? Google. Yeah, Google's the best place to go, right? That, you guys should become pro-Googlers. Like by the time you're done, especially if you're a programmer, become a pro-Googler, right? Next after that, MDN, that should be like your next direct source point. Uh, after that, Slack, right? Talk to Sean on Slack, because you get Sean right away when you talk to Sean on Slack. You send him an email, it might be a week before you get a response. So Slack, always Slack, okay? Um, cool. Any questions about the assignment? No? All right. Good luck then on it. Okay, let's uh, move on. Let's talk a little bit about last week. Hopefully this is not new. Hopefully you watch the YouTube video. <laughs> I don't have high expectations based on the video count. Um, all right, introducing objects. Debugging in JavaScript, we talked a little bit about debugging. Basically, we just opened up this one little side panel over here called the console. The console gives you a lot of feedback. When you create an error, uh, the console will provide a piece of feedback telling you where the error occurs, what kind of error it is. Um, it gives you a lot of information to help you resolve whatever the error is. For example, say you attempt in your code to access a variable that you haven't defined yet. So let's do who's it dot length. So I haven't defined who's it, who's it doesn't exist, and now I'm attempting to call length on it, right? If I call who's it itself by its lonely little bit, it's going to actually spit out an error. It won't necessarily, in no, well, it will. It will in your code. Um, if you've defined it by having given it a value, that's totally cool because it, tend, it gets initiated with a value automatically. Does anybody know what that value will be? If you don't assign it any actual value, like a literal value, what value does your variable immediately have? What is it? No, that's the scope if you define it with var. No, this is a value. It's a primitive value in JavaScript. Does anybody know what it is? It's undefined. So undefined is an actual value. It's a primitive inside JavaScript, just like uh, Boolean is, just like string is, just like number is. They're all primitives. Um, undefined is a primitive. And when you, when you instantiate a variable but don't give it a value, it immediately becomes undefined. And that's its value to start with. Undefined will resolve as false, too. If you try to use it as a conditional, it'll resolve as false. However, undefined can be annoying for people because obviously in strict languages when you try to access a variable that has no value you get back an actual error right like it just says dude this this has no value you can't access this stupid thing you need to go put a value inside of it whereas in javascript no error which can be a little bit of a catch right because you're kind of expecting an error uh, but it won't give you an error anyways 
If you don't instantiate the variable, and you try to access a variable you haven't instantiated in the console, you will get an uncaught reference error. The reference error basically refers to that this thing you're trying to reference does not exist. That's basically what the message is telling you. It says, whose it is not defined. Not whose it is undefined. That is different. <laughs> it's whose it is not defined, meaning it doesn't exist. Okay? Uh, and then it gives you a little bit more information. It tells you what file it's in. Well, it's not in a file because it's in the console, so it comes up anonymous, right? And then the last two pieces of information are the line number that it occurred on, which is one, and the character number where they found it, right? So it starts right at the beginning because we tried to access who's it right from the, from the character line number one. So that's basically how you destructure an error message. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, please do this. Please go through the YouTube video, you know, catch up, all right? The debugger is a really handy operator that you can apply to your code. Does anybody know what the debugger does? It's a breakpoint. Thank you, yes. Debugger is a breakpoint. It creates a breakpoint in your code. Now, most IDEs, when you're working with languages like Java or C++, uh, Visual Code specifically, gives you the ability to create breakpoints by just touching the line numbers on the side. It creates a little circle for you or some sort of indicator that you created a breakpoint there. And then that will show up when you go to compile your code. It, does, it goes into debugger mode and it starts at that point. Basically, the whole idea of debugger mode is I'm interpreting your code and I pause the application at that particular point, but we're running. We haven't running applications, just paused at that point. The benefit is that because you're moving in and out of different scopes within your code, right? You're not necessarily always going to be globally scoped. You might be within a function. All the variables you define inside a function are invisible to you at the global level. You can't see them. You can't see what their values are. You don't know if they're getting the appropriate value. That's where the debugger comes in handy because the debugger allows you to put a breakpoint right inside that function, which means when the function is called, it will stop. The application will pause right at that particular point and allow you to evaluate anything within that scope, which means if you have an error after the function has been called and you know roughly that the function was the problem, you can go ahead and put a debugger in there and test your logic inside there to be able to tell whether or not what you've written is correct, right? So debugger is very, very handy operator. Uh, in the code on the left-hand side here, we go through the step of adding in a debugger, and all it is is just a simple word debugger. That's it, right? And I kind of show it in here. These little eval windows, these windows here, these practice windows, these are actually scoped little blocks. You have no access to these variables whatsoever unless you're in the block. So like for example, if I type sum over here in the window, uncaught reference error. That's because it's in here, it's not out here. Even if I execute this window and skip the debugger, so now I've executed, that, that has been run. If I try to access sum out here, still uncaught reference error because it's scoped to that little window, just as equivalent to if you scoped inside a function, which is essentially what's happened. I've basically scoped inside a function, so these variables, all this logic that's in here is inside the window, not accessible outside the window. So what I can do is I can put a debugger in there, and when I execute, what will happen is the debugger will execute and pause at that particular line and allow me to be able to evaluate my code. So this is the source tab that's inside your console. And the source tab actually shows you a breakdown of what your stuff looks like. Now it's a little goofy looking because I'm using eval. These underscore, underscore, environment, underscore, underscore, you guys don't see, it's abstracted from you. But safe to say that this is, this code you see here is the same code that's over here. If I go over to the console window, select the console, I now have access to all of the code that's inside of here, and I can call the variables. Now, do I have access to value of sum? Why? It doesn't reach data. Exactly. We haven't actually interpreted this yet, so this hasn't executed, so I don't have access to this yet. But I do have access to sum, right? So I can actually see what the value of sum is now. If I type sum in, I can see that sum is 1538. 
right? And then I can go, oh, well, that's way too much. That's not what it's supposed to be. And I can decode or refactor my logic and fix it if that's the issue. <clears throat> if that is confusing, as some of the faces are telling me it is, please watch the week four YouTube video <laughs> and do the lesson. Okay? Very, very important. Especially considering everything we're going to do today interacts with this lesson, such as objects. <laughs> we talk about objects for the first time. We talk about how everything inside JavaScript is basically an object, but it's not absolutely everything. There is a group of things inside JavaScript that are not objects. Does anybody know what those are called? They're not objects. They're called primitives. There's primitives inside JavaScript, those are not objects. The primitives are strings, numbers, booleans, uh, undefined, and null. Those, there's five primitives, okay? And these are not objects. Some people say, oh, but I can do, you know, I can do things like this, right? Here's my string, you know, here's Sean, right? And I can press dot. There you go, that proves it's an object. Look at all those methods and properties that are attached to this thing. It must be an object. But that's not what's happening. Does anybody know what's actually occurring? Never. Never? <laughs> Essentially what happens, it takes this, the second you hit dot, it creates the string object, puts the value, Sean, into the string object, which is the constructor, and creates a new object and returns it back. That's all happening under the hood, completely obfuscated from you. So it looks like Sean is an object, but it isn't. It's a string primitive. So that's something to just be aware of. Um, there will be a primitive question on the, there's one on the quiz. Uh, there will be one on the test as well in the midterm. But essentially there's primitive objects. There are a lot of built-in objects inside JavaScript. Uh, like there's the data objects, which are the basic ones that you work with, like string, number, boolean, array, object, and function. There are the six basic data objects that you will work with. Object is the base object. We're going to talk about inheritance today. Everything inherits from object, the base. So every single thing you work with, except for the primitives, will inherit from object automatically. And then objects you create automatically inherit from object. Everything inherits from object. <coughs> and we'll, we'll show that. We'll work through the, the breakdown. Uh, we showed in the lesson how to get the object property names. Just out of curiosity, did anybody in the class do the math one? And can they tell me how many properties were associated with math? 42. 42. Yeah? How many? You don't remember? Or I'll spit it out. Why not? Actually, we'll just execute it. Uh, you said 42? 43, you're very close. I mean, you were super, super close. <laughs> you almost convinced me, yeah. Incidentally, the window object, <clears throat> the window object has tons, tons of properties. Does anybody know ballparkish? How many the window object has? How many properties the window object has? You're a lot closer than he is. <laughs> almost 900. Almost 900 properties. Those properties get instantly created the second you open the browser. They're just, bam, there they are, ready to go. You get access to them immediately. There's some cool information in that window thing too. There's like the navigator. This navigator here tells you information about your browser. Gives you information about what browser you're using, what device you might be using it on, whether or not you have Bluetooth or not, tons of different information. All inside that little navigator object which you can see here, see Bluetooth, clipboard, connections, cookie enabled. So if you don't have cookies enabled, I can go, oh, you don't have cookies enabled. Go dunk your head <laughs> and re-enable cookies, please. Uh, geolocation, keyboards, language, there's tons of information all inside the Navigator object that tells me what kind of instance your browser is, right? Now you can fake that. You can actually, there's um, extensions you can get for Chrome that will overwrite the Navigator object and change its values so that you can obscure it from other people. Cool. The window object, very, very super important. The document object, so bloody important. We have one, two, three, three classes on it. 
three full classes on the document object because that's our DOM. It's basically our web page. Um, and it's all the properties we're going to use to be able to interact with our web page, including the event system that's built into the browser that will allow us to deal with like clicks, double clicks, mouse overs, all those type of things, right? But that's in the future. All right, creating a custom object. We looked at creating object literals. Please remember this syntax today because we're going to use it. Basically, an object literal is a literal object. That's really what it is. This is an object literal. It's just the two curly braces. Everything inside there is just key value pairs that creates the object literal. You can assign it to a variable if you want to, um, but the curly braces is what defines that as an object literal. Uses key value pairs, kind of like JSON. Uh, how many of you have actually used JSON before? So just a couple of you. Okay, so JSON is uh, JavaScript object notation. We have a class where we'll be using JavaScript object notation because uh, we'll be connecting to an API and grabbing it back and the data packet we get back is JSON. Um, that's essentially what JSON looks like. The difference between object literals and actual JSON though is you can't put functions inside JSON. There's no way because it's a string. It's really just a string. It's a formatted string. Um, so you can't, put ob you can't put functions in there, you can't put objects in there, but you can put, well, you kind of can put objects in there. You just can't put objects with functionality in them. Um, but you can put like the object structure, you can put array structures, strings, booleans, numbers. Those can all go in there. Uh, in here we create an actual object. Accessing an object, very simple. Same syntax as what you guys use for Java. It's exactly the same syntax. It's the name of your object, dot, and whatever property it is. That's it. If it's a method, then it's dot, the name of the method, like the name of the symbol, and then two parentheses to execute it. It's exactly the same. Shouldn't be any new for you. Defining a method inside an object, not super difficult, but does take advantage of the anonymous functions, right? You can define a named function inside JavaScript, and if you're using ES2015, it does some magic in the background. Basically what it will do is it will take the name, it'll move it over here and turn the name into a property, and then make the function itself an anonymous function and spit the definition into that property value. Confusing? <laughs> so it, I find this syntax is a little bit more straightforward, but if you want to jump ahead and just use name functions, go for it. All right, adding methods is very simple. You can add them internally just by creating a new method inside. You can also do them externally by just referencing the property and then assigning it a, a function definition of some sort. Uh, adding object properties, same deal. Then we get into something called object constructors. And that was the last part. An object constructor in JavaScript is essentially just a function. That's all it is. It's just a basic function. But Functions in JavaScript have this cool property called prototype attached to them. And that prototype allows us to create properties inside our function and associate it with our function, turning it into what's known as a constructor. You guys have worked with constructors before, right? Um, the constructor is basically when you instantiate a new object, the constructor is the method that gets called when you instantiate, right? That's what constructors are. How many didn't know that? Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. Maybe you're the only honest one in the class. <laughs> but yeah, so constructors will get called the second you instantiate the class. When you destroy a class, does anybody know what it gets called? Destructors. Destructors get called when you destroy a class and it executes that method. Does anybody know what gets called when you copy one constructor or copy one object into another? Copy you're very close. Copy constructor. <laughs> Copy constructor gets called. Take C++ if you find that stuff kind of interesting, because then you get the very low level version of that. Um, and if you have me, you'll actually create copy constructors, destructors, and constructors as well. But in JavaScript, the one big important thing to understand about objects inside JavaScript is that objects are instantaneous. They are immediately available to you. They exist instantly. It's not like classes in other languages. Classes in other languages are a blueprint. They're like a template for what your object is going to look like, right? But that class means diddly squat until you actually create an object from it. That class has no bearing inside your application. It's just code, just sitting in there like a placeholder 
until you actually create something from it. In JavaScript, that's not the case. When you create a function constructor like this, an object constructor, this is just a function. You can still call that like any other function that you would call in JavaScript. But even further, it says function, but it's an object. Okay? Because most things in JavaScript are objects except for the five primitives that I just mentioned, which means person is available to you immediately. You can actually start adding properties to it without ever calling the function whatsoever. You can start adding properties to it. You can add methods to it. You can do whatever you want with it. So that's something that can be confusing for a lot of people working with JavaScript because you don't get classes available to you. Now, <coughs> ES2015, um, I keep saying ES, but I never actually explained what it means. ES stands for ECMA script. ECMAScript is a standardization. It's basically a document, right? Just like the W3C has the HTML specification or the CSS specification, ECMAScript is the same kind of idea. It's a document that basically says, hey, if you want to call yourself an ECMAScript standardized browser, ECMAScript 2015 standardized browser, you must have these 26 functions implemented inside your API. That's basically all it means. They must input, take these as input, and they must return these. However you code the middle, like whatever you do to create the logic in the center, is totally up to you. We don't care, but those functions need to exist. That's basically it. Anybody coded with OpenGL before? No? OpenGL is the same idea. OpenGL says if you want to call yourself an OpenGL certified GPU, which is your graphics processing unit, right, your video card, if you want to call yourself an OpenGL specified card, then you must have a MAT4, you must have vectors, you must be able to have a buffer, you must have these different functions. I don't care how you implement them, but they must exist. That's why, you know, NVIDIA cards might outperform uh, AMD cards in certain like instances depending on the game because of whatever functions that game is using might be implemented differently in each card. ECMAScript is no different. Each browser can implement ECMAScript however they choose as long as the functions are there and what our parameters they take are the same and what output they receive or return is the same. That's all that matters. All right, cool. So ECMAScript introduced this wonderful thing called class. I'm not gonna write it down which looks a lot like the classes you guys are used to. You can create a constructor inside there and everything else, yada yada. But behind the scenes, what essentially happens, that class gets ripped apart to shreds. They turn it into prototypal inheritance, which we're gonna learn today. And it all gets shoved back into the interpreter as prototypal inheritance, which means understanding those classes are there is basically all you really need to know. Being able to do it with prototypal inheritance makes you a lot better of a JavaScript programmer, as far as I'm concerned. All right, cool. And then we just spit out the lab code. That's the longest review we've ever had, 35 minutes? I mean, missing lessons sucks. All right, are you ready for object inheritance? You feel like that 35 minutes was enough? <laughs> You now are like grounded in objects, no? Okay, well cool enough, I know that the object lesson can be confusing, so we're going to build objects today as well. So you get kind of a recap for those of you that actually watch the, I'm just curious, how many of you actually watch the YouTube video? Really? Okay, cool, that's awesome. Then I take it back, I'm proud of you guys. That's cool, all right. Let's do, uh, let's talk a bit about passing by value versus passing by reference. In JavaScript, um, primitives pass by value immediately. So strings, numbers, boolean, undefined, and null are all passed by value. So their, whatever their value is, it's copied and then put into whatever it's being assigned to. Function definitions also pass by value because they are a value. So they will pass, they will copy themselves and be passed in, and arrays will also pass by value. If you assign them to another object or to another variable, they will pass by value. Objects do not pass by value. Objects always pass by reference. So I drew a very fancy little picture, like my fancy picture. This is done with Illustrator. 
<coughs> up top here, these are memory addresses. So inside your computer, you have RAM. When an application is processing, it allocates sections of your RAM for different pieces. So some of it gets allocated to something called stack. Something gets allocated to something called heap. Stack is fast, heap is slow. That's it in a very oversimplified nutshell. When you create a variable, it creates the variable on the stack. So it goes and says to stack, hey, do you have room for this thing that I want to create? I need a memory location for this thing. Stack says, yeah, cool, here's your memory location. So it gives them the memory location, but we don't want to have to reference our crap by 0x0000883a, because that's annoying. We want to just reference by x. So x becomes an alias to that address location. It becomes a reference point to the address location. So when we create 5, what happens is 5 goes and gets stored inside that address location, and there's like so much room that is stored for that particular 5, right? So it's an integer, so it's likely 8 bytes, right? 8 bytes get stored into that location, sorry, 4 bytes. 4 bytes get stored into that location. Now, if I take x and I assign it to y, because 5 is a primitive, what's going to happen is we're going to get a reference of 5. It's going to get moved from that location, sorry, not moved, copied from that location into y, which will move it in aliases to the other memory location. So these two memory locations have their own copy of 5, right? Which means if I edit x and make it equal to 6, what value is y? 5, right, because it doesn't change, because it's, it's a copy, right? So it doesn't change at all. It remains the same, okay? <coughs> so down here, created our wonderful little interactive IDEs, and I've added something new to our interactive IDEs. I've added answer boxes, where we can actually type in answers now. It's pretty cool, and it works well. All right, so the following is an example of pass by value. Let x equal 5, let y equal x, x equals 6. So go ahead and type your answer into the two boxes. x should be equal to, put whatever number you think x should be equal to. And then in the y box, put whatever number you think y should be equal to. And then when you're done, click execute. <coughs> okay, so what value should x be? How many people say six? How many people say five? Cool. So six. And what value should y be equal to? Five. Yay! And if you did it, it should say pass at the top of the block. <coughs> the block. Did I say block? I think you said block. Block. <laughs> Johan, Sebastian, block. There you go. All right. So pass by reference is different than pass by value, right? Because pass by value means the value gets copied into multiple different address locations as many times as you copy that until you run out of address locations, right? But pass by reference works a little bit different. So basically when you pass by reference, you're actually passing the memory address around. That's what's happening. So in this scenario, I have x. x is equal to, what is this thing? Does anybody know? A uh, what? <laughs> Sounded like bull string though. <laughs> this is an object literal, right? So there's our object, has one property, A, has value, 5, right? This is the value currently of x. x is equal to this object, right? Now, if I access the property A and reassign 6 to it, that's totally fine. x A becomes 6, right? Which means 6 is no longer 5, or sorry, x is no longer 5, it's 6. Over here, I've made y equal to x. When this started off, y would have been equal to this object here. But that is incorrect. y is not equal to the object. What is y equal to? The memory location. It's equal to this memory location up here. It doesn't give a damn what value is in the memory location. It is just currently referencing the memory location. That's all it's doing. Which means y is literally x. They are the same thing. They are identical. So when this turns to x dot a6, a is equal to 6. 
y dot a must be equal to 6, exactly, because it's passed by reference. It just keeps moving around. All it's doing is referencing that address location. So whatever value is currently sitting in that address location is immediately what it's equal to. Okay, so scroll down. We have a, we have a little thing. I'll give you a second here to fill this one out. I mean, it should be easy. It's literally the thing we just talked about. <laughs> Go ahead. X dot A is equal to, and then Y dot A is equal to. Cool, you must be done. So what is X dot A equal to? Six. Okay. And what is Y dot equal to? Nice, I didn't hear any fives. Just a lot of hissing. Almost sounded like steam. <laughs> there we go. If you hit execute, it should say past. Woo! I mean, Java's similar, right? Primitives get passed by value in Java, right? Strings, numbers, all those things are passed by value, right? They're copied. They're not references to those things. They're, they're, they're copied, right? And objects in Java, they're not copied, are they? They're definitely passed by reference. If it's like any language like a C-based language, then they're definitely passed by reference. <coughs> Any questions about pass by value or pass by reference? I do like to put these on tests on occasion, just to just a hint there. So why is this important? Understanding pass by value and pass by reference will help you to better understand how inheritance works in Java script. Whoa! <laughs> Before we discussed how objects are immediately instantiated, because of this, inheritance is a bit unique in JavaScript. There are two common ways inheritance are performed in JavaScript, and we're going to talk about the simplest method first, which is object literal inheritance. Okay? I used to start off with object constructors. I'm happy I don't do that anymore. <laughs> inheritance using object literals. All right, before we do that, does anybody need a break? 644. No? We're good? Cool. Let's power on then. All right. Creating an object literal. Object literals are just objects created using the curly brace syntax. That's it. This thing is an object. Simple as it looks, that's an object. We didn't have to do object new or new object or anything like that. All we had to do was create the curly braces and that immediately becomes an object. Somebody your mom's calling. Last week we demonstrated object constructors and how we can use them to create a basic template for object creation. So the cool thing about object constructors is we can create these wonderful templates. People can create new objects using those templates, right? But then we can kind of force some structure and conformity using those. Now we can do the same thing with object literals, but we have to think outside the box a little bit because we can't force the object constructor ish. Like, when you build an object with an object constructor, they have to meet the requirements of the object constructor because it's going to execute. The second the object gets created, the object constructor immediately executes. Because of that, we need to think outside the box a little bit and change how we're going to build this. And generally what we'll do when you're using object literals to create an object template, you're going to create something called an initializer method. So this is an initializer method merely in name alone. That's it. It's just the name of it that's the initializer, which means when you create the object, you will have to actually call the initializer. Otherwise, it won't initialize, right? So that's one thing to note. Um, so let's do, let's do one now. We're going to create a, an object, literal, and we're going to call it food, right? F-O-O-D, capital F-O-O-D. Make sure you do it with a capital because the script will glitch if you don't title your object the same as what I've listed there. So, little object, I'm gonna do let food, because we're gonna edit it. So make sure you use let, if you use const, you won't be able to edit the object. Let food equal, badunk. There we go, there's my literal object. Now, I can create the initializer method in two different ways. I can either do it internally, so I can just keep breaking out my object and working internally inside those curly braces and adding new methods and properties. Or I can do it externally, right? So either way is totally optional for me. Um, I'm going to do, well, we're going to create two functions on it. So I'm going to create one internally. Totally up to you how you want to build those. As long as your method is called init, it doesn't matter. <coughs> this one I'm going to do function. Function needs one parameter, which is type. 
And all it's going to do is assign a new property on food to type. And that's my init function. So now when I create a new food object, I need to remember to call init so that I can actually initialize it with a type. Otherwise, it won't be initialized. <coughs> cool. So we did step two, create an initializer. We created a property on it called type, and we assigned it to the property of type. Now, in step three, we're going to create a method called eat that returns you ate this type. So I'm going to copy that quoted line. There we go. I'm going to come back up here, and I'm just going to create it underneath here. I'm going to do food dot eat. So this time I'm creating externally is equal to this wonderful anonymous function. Return, paste that thing in place, <clears throat> and whammo blemo, I now have a food object. <coughs> so when you're creating your object templates, there's a few things to keep in mind. We talked about this last week. For those of you that watched the YouTube video, objects, it's best to think of them like nouns, right? They're like people, places, or things. Food is a thing, right? We want to think of objects as a way to encapsulate an entire idea, all within one thing. All the properties, all the methods should be encapsulated in this wonderful object, right? So food encapsulates you know, our initializer function and our eat function because all food should be edible. If it's not edible, why is it food, right? Edible food kind of makes sense. So it's encapsulating this one idea. When you think of methods, you should be thinking of verbs. They're actions, right? They're things that can occur on something. They, they're things that can be acted upon on the object or on a property on the object. Either way, they should be an action. That leaves properties. Properties are best described as like adjectives, right? They're descriptions. They're basically describing the object in some way or another. They might describe its current state. They might describe its color or its size or where it's currently located. But they're usually descriptive, right? Those properties are descriptions. So we call them adjectives. So object, noun, properties, adjectives, methods, verbs. Cool? Cool. All right, so if you execute this, it should work. That's all the code you need. Sure enough, it says passed. And it should say you ate the Soylent Green if everything is working in the console. Anybody actually get that reference? No? Look it up. <laughs> you do? Yeah. It's from The Simpsons, but it's older than that. All right. So the above practice creates a very generic object called food. Remembering what we had said about objects, objects should encapsulate an idea. They can be correlated with nouns, person, place, or thing, right? Food is a thing, and it's a very generic category encompassing a huge collection of possibilities, right? There are so many different types of foods. Our property type will allow us to assign a type to our object. There are quite a few possibilities for types, depending on how you want to actually break down your categorization. You know, you can break it down as meat, vegetable, potato, or meat, vegetable, potato, what the? Meat, vegetable, fruit, or grain. Or you can break it down to, like, maybe a recipe-type-based category, so, like, dessert, appetizer, or main. It would probably be better to be more granular, or start, sorry, more broad, and then work your way down granular, like you do in, you know, uh, cust or standard um, class inheritance. Uh, same kind of idea. Our options are endless, and with inheritance, we can start general and become more specific with each child object. One thing to note when you're working with inheritance, not composition, but when you're working with inheritance, JavaScript uh, works in a chain. So unlike languages like C++, where you can do multiple inheritance, which means, think of it like this way, I have, in C++, I have... Dad, let's be progressive. Dad, here we go. Child, right? So child can actually inherit from both of these objects. In JavaScript, it doesn't work that way. I can have 
grandparent. I'm just going to do grand P. Father, child, but you know, you can have multiple children. That's totally fine, but it only goes ancestry, like one single ancestor, unfortunately. That's the way it works. Does anybody know how to break outside of this so that you don't have to do kind of vertical? You can work horizontally. You're on the right track because that's another kind of terminology for it, but it's called composition. Composition is basically where instead of child being automatically inherited from father and grandfather, that's not necessary, right? Because child is going to be its own little unique unicorn, right? So because child is going to be different from grandfather and father, they don't necessarily need everything grandfather and father has, right? It's the whole concept of if you ask me for honey and I give you a whole bee's nest, you don't need the whole bee's nest. You just need the honey. That's the only part that you actually need. Composition basically works like that. I can have honey. Oh, that goes to there. I can have job. And it goes to there. Composition basically just gives child exactly the things it requires. Whatever functionality or whatever properties it requires. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this and not do my job very well, no. as you say. Uh, but would that be kind of like an abstract class? Um, I know them as traits. So I believe traits and abstract classes are similar, or interfaces. Interfaces are extremely similar. Interface defines only one kind of ideal, but it tells you exactly how those things are supposed to be implemented. That's what an interface is. Um, it's kind of like an interface, but it encapsulates this one idea. An abstract class, you just have methods with no value. But there's multiples, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is one. Okay. Like, literally one function. That's it. And this guy gets this one function. Okay. Yeah. Though that's in JavaScript. That's more like the composition in JavaScript. You can create bigger functions that encapsulate multiple singular functions and then give them that thing. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting. I've got a I we're gonna talk a little bit about it towards the bottom of this. Um, and I have a link to somebody who can explain it a hell of a lot better than I can. Um, that's uh, MPJ interview of watching the fun fun function videos. Okay, well, I've got some links from him in there. Um, fun, fun function is a fantastic way if you want to learn more about things like composition over inheritance, uh, prototypal inheritance, um, functional programming, which is how like purists, JavaScript purists, want you to program. They want you to program using functional programming, not class programming. Um, so yeah, it is worthwhile to look that up. Cool. Any other questions about FUD? No? Good? Yes, Ben. Soiling green. What did you get? Nothing? How did you get soiling green? Like, what did you put in this? Like, so in the background, I, in order to evaluate whether or not you created the object create correctly, I instantiate a version of your object. I then call the init method on it. And then I call eat on it. So when I initialize it, I initialize it with soiling green. And then I call your method eat, which should say you ate the soiling green. Yeah, and I console log it out for entertainment purposes. <laughs> yeah, it failed miserably. All right. Um, <laughs> inheritance using object.create. So we created an object. Should be totally old news, right? Because you guys did it last week, for those of you that watched the YouTube video. Or maybe some of you just powered through the lab. That's totally cool, too. <clears throat> Anyways, creating an object, that's simple stuff, right? That's, that's kitty stuff. The only difference is, is how we're thinking about that object literal has slightly changed because instead of creating an object literal called person and like hard coding the name Sean and hard coding you know their age and their date of birth, we're thinking a little bit more abstractly, right? We're going to create this initializer method that will set our values for us, right? So our object literal is still an object literal, but now it's been a little bit more abstracted, more general, more template, right? We're basically creating a template. So inheritance using object.create. Object inheritance can be likened to that of a parent-child inheritance. <clears throat> we as ch children of our parents inherit traits from them. Our hair color, eye color, build, facial features, and even mannerisms are direct connections to our parents. Or even ancestors, right? Like 
you know, a child can be born with blue eyes to two brown-eyed parents because an ancestor like six generations ago had blue eyes. That kind of thing, right? Anyways, that's different. That has nothing to do with this. <laughs> However, we become more specific and unique versions by modifying these properties or acquiring new ones, right? Child might have different implementations of methods and stuff like that. In some languages, you have overriding. Uh, most languages, you have overriding where even though father might have brown eye color, child might have blue eye color, right? Because it's been overridden. That property is overridden. <coughs> Um, however, we don't always intend to inherit from one parent, so this structure, right, we usually inherit from both, and that's where composition comes in better when we want to do this kind of structure. <coughs> All right, the object, object, this is important to throw it into quotes to understand, the object, object, which is what everything inherits from in JavaScript, every object inherits from the object object, the base object, we'll call it base object just for clarity, from the base object. Um, it has some handy properties that you can work with on objects, and we saw one last week with the get own property names. It's a method that's available on the object. So every single object that you create will have that property available to it, providing you haven't overridden it and wrote it out to your own thing. But it should have that property available to it. Um, object get own property names basically, for those of you that don't know, it retrieves a shallow list of all the properties defined on the object. So it will not recursively call through the inheritance chain. It will only show you the very shallow list that is available to that object. None of the inherited properties, unfortunately. And it returns that shallow list as an array. Object create is another method that's available on the base object. And this thing actually creates a new object using a past object as a template, right? So you can say, cool, I want you to create, in the case of food, right? I want you to create vegetable, right? And I'm going to pass you food as my starting template. It's not much different than this idea. I want you to create father, but I want you to start with grandparent as the template, right? Then I want you to create this child, but I want you to start with father as a template, okay? You can do the same kind of idea in JavaScript. Same idea using object create. The created object will create a reference to the original object. So that's important to understand. So when you create father, right, it's actually going to create a reference to grandfather. It doesn't copy the contents from here to here, right? Remember past my reference? It's not going to take all the stuff that's in grandfather and plug it into father meaning you can just edit them out and do whatever you want with them. The cool thing about that is this stays its own little encapsulated universe, which means if you make changes on grandfather, they're immediately available to father. Just the same as with classes, kind of, right? Only this can be dynamically, right? You can do this while running your application, make changes to grandfather, immediately have them available to father because objects exist immediately, right? All right, cool. So this is a little demonstration of object create. We have let obj equal to uh, an object, an object literal with three properties, a, b, and c. Nothing new, pretty easy. We have a second object underneath it. And in this object, we're actually calling object.create. And we're passing it the obj object, right? We're passing it in. So basically what's going to happen is A, B, C, those properties are going to get basically inherited by the OBJ inherent. It's because it's going to create a reference to those properties. All right? Because it's going to create a reference to it, if I change the A property on OBJ, right, then OBJ inherit, its A property will have been changed. Okay? Because it's a reference to A. So whatever value obj's a is, immediately gets inherited by obj inherit. Unless I override it. If I override it by changing obj.inherit, then that means it won't cascade back up the chain. It becomes its own thing. Okay? So we can see that. <coughs> create a new property on the new obj externally. So let's do that first. We're going to create obj inherit dot d. <coughs> Make sure you do .d, because I think the evaluation code in the background is a little strict. 
<coughs> so obj.d, and we're going to make it equal to some random crazy number. Whatever you want, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so that will create the D on obj inherit. Now I want you to, in step two, create a new property on the original obj object. Okay, so we'll do obj.e, make this 256. And then last, answer the following questions. So obj inherit has the newly created obg, obj property, right? So obj inherit is inheriting from obj, right? That means whatever properties, because it's all by reference, whatever properties are created on obj are immediately available to obj inherit. So go ahead and answer that question with that information. <laughs> All right, so now OBJ has the newly created OBJ inherit property. Now this is saying that this property we created on OBJ inherit, this statement says it's now available to OBJ. How many think that's true? How many think that's false? Cool, go ahead and enter your answers. So we're going to say true and false, hit execute, and if everything's good, should say passed. <coughs> if you're more interested in digging under the hood, um, you can always right click and look at the source code under evaluate.js. That's where I put these tests in that actually test the code. You can go ahead and take a look at that, and that you can see um, exactly what I use for the evaluation to actually evaluate against those, if you want. Or send me a message and I'll just send you the code. It's totally fine too. It's also sitting in GitHub as well, which you guys should all be currently have access to. All right. In the code above, we can see that while obj inherit contains the new property defined on obj, obj does not contain the new property that was defined on obj inherit. So let me re-say that so a way that's not so freaking confusing. In the code above, we can see that while the child contains a new property defined on the parent. The parent does not contain any new, new properties on the child, right? So whatever properties you define on the child are always unique to the child. Whatever properties you define on the parent, though, are automatically shared with the child, right? So if, whatever. <laughs> if dad has a new car, child immediately gets access to the new car. But if child buys a new car, dad doesn't get access to the new car. Mm -hmm. so, especially if child's paying the insurance. All right. <laughs> this is because the property defined on the parent will be carried through to all of its children who inherited from it. But each child is unique unto themselves. So any new properties defined on them will be unique. If a new object was to inherit from them, though, so if the child has children of their own, then whatever they own now becomes available to that child too. Okay? Cool. Let's demonstrate one more object.create. So we have obj equal to the same set of values that we had before. We inherit. Now we're inheriting again. So now we've inherited three times. So it basically looks like this. This is the chain of inheritance. Here we go. That is not an n. And then once again. Good enough. All right, that's basically our inheritance chain. Okay, right, so we created there. So now we've taken once again dot d and we assigned it a value of 256. Then we took obj dot inherit, sorry, inherit dot e, and we assigned it 305. And then we took obj dot f and we made it equal to the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, 42, right? If you don't know what that is, you should need to read the Douglas Adams book. So all of that is there, so now answer these wonderful questions. <laughs> if you're not sure what the value of something is, go ahead and type a console log into that little IDE and spit out what the value should be, and then write whatever the value is into 
that thing, okay? <clears throat> I'll give you a few seconds there. Seriously, if you haven't seen Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's a good movie. The book is better, but you need to watch the movie. All right, what's after this out of curiosity? Right, inheritance with the object little. I think we'll complete the inheritance part for this, and before we move on to function constructors, we'll get you know drinks, food, whatever we need. All right, take a break for a slight few minutes <coughs> before I completely lose my voice. All right, let's answer these questions. Once again, dot f is equal to what? How many people say undefined? How many people say something other than 42? How many people say 42? All right. Cool. Object inherit.d is equal to undefined. All right. Undefined. Remember I said undefined is a value, right? What type of value is it? Is it an object? No. It's a primitive. Exactly. It's a primitive. And object.e, obj.e, undefined. There we go. Click execute. If everything's golden, it should say passed. <coughs> Looks like a stray console log got through. Cool. As you can see, once again, dot f contains the value of obj.f because of inheritance, right? So whatever value you set on obj.f will get passed down to all the children. So if you say dot a is equal to 42, that'll get referred here. And referred here, unless obj.inherit.a has its own property, right? So if I create .a here and make it equal to 256, what will .a be equal to here? Will it be equal to 42 or 256? Exactly, because when it refers, it's going to check here first and say, hey, do you have dot .a? Because I don't have dot .a. Do you have dot .a? This thing's going to say, yes, I do. If it said no, then it's going to check here and ask, do you have dot .a? Right? And then it will just carry down. And if this doesn't have dot .a, what would this be equal to? Undefined. Exactly. Undefined. Blah, 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 blah. Cool. <clears throat> Let's finish off our inheritance. So I've already copied food over, you, over to you. If providing you've clicked execute, make sure you read these little snippet notes. Note, this comes from practice three. You must have completed and clicked execute on practice three for the following variable to work. That includes if you refresh your browser. If you refresh your browser, you have to zip up and click execute on number three and come back down again. I will resolve that at some point. I haven't figured out how yet, but I will resolve that. All right, because it keeps bugging me. So I've copied food over for you. Now step one, create a new object called vegetable that inherits from food using the object create method. Well, we know how to do that now. So we're gonna say let vegetable with a capital V, very important, with a capital V, equals, what's my syntax? Very important syntax. I want to create using the food object, yeah, object dot create, Fantastic, thank you. It's Nick, right? Yeah, thanks, Nick. All right, step two, initialize vegetable by calling dot init. Because remember, unlike the object constructors, this doesn't immediately call initialize. Initialize is just a made up freaking word. That's all it is. We made it up. We could have called it Bob. It doesn't matter what we call it. That's totally made up. We don't need to, you, if you call it constructor, it doesn't make it a constructor, right? It's just a made up word. So in order to call it and actually initialize, we have to actually call initialize. So we're going to say vegetable dot init, and then we're just going to pass it vegetable. And that value in there actually doesn't matter as long as it isn't food. If you pass it food, it won't work. But obviously, because it's not food, it's vegetable. It's its own type. All right, step three, create a new method on vegetable called set color. So this kind of shows that now 
Vegetable is its own little unique unicorn, right? It's its own little thing. It's not food. It might inherit from food, but it is its own unique thing. And vegetables have color. Well, most food has color. I haven't seen black and white food, but even black and white is color, right? So it doesn't matter. It still has color. So we're going to create a new method on it called set color. And we're just going to do that nice and externally. We're going to say vegetable dot set color o u r. Make sure you write o u r. This is Canada. <laughs> All right. Equals. Do we have any Americans in here? Right. Is anybody like internationally from America? Like the United States, not this America, not North America. I know United States is a part of North America. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> All right. Let's create a function. Obviously, we need a parameter. I don't care what you call the parameter, but I'm going to call mine color. All right, let's embrace the people from the north or from the south. We'll take the U out of that one. You do what you want; it doesn't matter. All right, and then we're going to say this dot. Oh, I goofed. You still need to do color there because I do evaluate it. This dot color with a U is equal to my parameter. <coughs> Right. Just to reiterate, this is a parameter, right? Because this is our function definition, so this is a parameter. When I pass a value to it, it becomes a what? An argument, right? Arguments are values you pass in. Parameters are like your placeholder symbols that you create. All right, step four. Create a new object called celery that inherits from vegetable. All right. So let's do let celery equal, what's my syntax? There we go. Object.create vegetable. Vegetable, right, veggie table. <laughs> you remember how to spell words your way. I don't remember how to spell them my way. So it's like secretary, it's secret, airy. <laughs> it's, I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's call init. If we don't call init, it won't be initialized. And I'm going to make it equal to celery, spelled correctly, not ey. And then we're going to set its color. You can set it to any color you want except for fuchsia, because I use fuchsia as a test, <laughs> so don't call it fuchsia. All right, celery dot set color, and we don't need to create a new function because where are we getting this function from? Exactly, we're getting it from vegetable. So we just need to pass it its value. <clears throat> I don't know what to call it now. I'm going to say rainbow. It's rainbow celery. I mean, celery turns, turns kind of red when you put it into Caesars, right? So <laughs> maybe we stuck it in a rainbow. There we go. Left it in a box of uh, Lucky Charms. Or, cheer, or no, Fruity Loops. There we go. Set color. Click execute, that should be everything. Should see a pass. Yep, I've got a pass. Hopefully you have a pass. Cool, I'm gonna move on. The above is an example of inheritance chain, right? Because we start with food, right? Food starts as our inheritance chain. Blah, 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 blah. Get rid of this stuff. I don't know why I like writing on the board. I didn't used to. So we start with food. Food goes to vegetable. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Vegetable goes to celery. Right? Food has the init method on it. Vegetable gets the init method. Celery gets the init method. Does food get set color? Nope. Vegetable? Set C. Set C. Cool. Easy to understand? Pretty straightforward? What's the key? What's the key function that ties all that inheritance together? What's the function we need to inherit from one object to another? Object.create. Fantastic. That's the thing you need to remember because when you're sitting there in the midterm and you're like, how the hell do I inherit from object literals again? As long as you remember object.create, you can go to MDN and they will show you how to do it. So that's what you want to remember. Plus you have these nodes with you, plus you have open access to the internet. I mean, it doesn't get easier than that. 
All right, I need a drink. Um, so why don't we take a break? Let's take 15 minutes. We'll meet back here for 7.30ish. Cool. So last week on the YouTube video, or in the last, depending on how you read it or did it, um, we talked about object constructors. Object constructors, they're really just functions. That's all they are. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's no new syntax you need to learn. They are just a function. That's all they are. Um, <laughs> however, they're pretty powerful because they are already an object, and functions have this very cool property of them called prototype, where you can actually give them um, properties and methods that are unique to the function itself, like that are private to the function. So object consumption constructors are simply just a standard function. We can use these functions to create a blueprint, just like classes do for what we want an object to look like. Any necessary properties it may need to contain. The only thing we haven't really discussed is what happens when we create an object using the object constructor method. The new keyword is what makes creating objects with object constructors doable. So now, that's important because when we create object literals and we want them to inherit from another object, we use object dot create, right? However, when we want to create just one object with an object literal, there we go, we created an object, done, right? However, when we use function constructors, when we use object constructors, because it's a function, we need some way to turn that function into a standard like object, kind of like an object literal. And the way we do that is we use the keyword new, which you guys should be used to, right? Because you have to call new when you want to take a class and create a new object out of it. You need to call new in order to create the object, right? It's like that in the majority of languages. Some languages, it's new and whatever the class name is. Other languages, it's the class name dot new. Just depends on the language you're working in. Um, in JavaScript, it's new and the name of the function, whatever the symbol name is for that function. Now, a common... A common naming um, scheme for function for function constructors, object constructors, is just like with classes where you capitalize them. You do snake case, but it's capital first capital, and then every word after it is also with a capital. <coughs> you do the same thing with the functions. If you're going to use them as an object constructor, you title them with a capital. That is not something you have to do. It's just common convention. Uh, allows you to be able to look at your code, and we use conventions like that so that we can look at our code and quickly see by that convention what something is, right? Because if you see person with a capital P, then you know that is likely an object constructor um, versus if with a lowercase p, which you can be like, yeah, cool, that's just a function, okay? So it returns the newly created. Here's basically what happens when we call new. When we call new, it creates a new empty object. This is under the hood. You don't see any of this. It just happens instantly. It creates a new empty object. It creates one of these. Then it sets a new property on the object called prototype. So it's literally going to give this thing this property called prototype. And then it binds all the properties that you define inside the function constructor with the keyword this as properties on prototype. So if inside here, I have this dot name in there, then on prototype, it'll immediately create the property name and give it whatever value has been assigned to it. So in this scenario, it'll be undefined. Okay? This is happening all under the hood. You're not seeing this. This is all abstracted from you, right? Then it returns this object back to you. That's what essentially happens. So once again, creates a new empty object, just an object literal. Signs it a property called prototype. Takes all the properties you define inside the function with the keyword this. So whether they were methods or properties, takes all of them immediately binds them to the prototype property, and then it returns back the object to you. 
and you now have this object. <laughs> I wrote down, simply put, it translates our function into an object. And that is in the simplest of ways, but there's a lot of magic that happens to get there. All right, I think the best thing we can do is actually create a new object using an object constructor, because I think we only created one last week. It's a good idea to get into the habit of creating them, right? You should be practicing those anyways when you go home. And you've got nothing to do, because I know that's so often the case, right? <laughs> you guys should just be creating object constructors. And what's more fun than an object constructor? All right, um, create a new person object constructor with the following properties. First name, last name, bio. And bio will be a method that will return this name, this last name is a mild-mannered individual by day. That's a very unique sentence. All right, so let's go ahead and copy that sentence out. There we go. From backtick to backtick. What does backticks do? What are they known as? String in ter pull relation. <laughs> Uh, in the end, we didn't get there. All right, so function, person. Now, because it's a object constructor, and we're going to be using the object constructor to actually as a proper constructor, which means when we initialize an object with it, it'll immediately fire off the object constructor, we can go ahead and give it its parameters right now. We know we're going to need first name, we're going to need last name, and we're going to need bio. And I imagine some of you by this point are like, do we really have to do that like every time? There are ways around it. Um, JavaScript supports the triple dot, which will basically break everything out that you put inside here into variables, and it's immediately <coughs> instantiated inside. Uh, maybe next week we'll take a look at that, just so we can clean this up a little bit. And you can always use the arrow function. How many of you actually know how to use the arrow function now? Or have used it? Have I showed you the arrow function? Really? Yeah, it's the Lambda. That guy knows how to use it. <laughs> what was the name again? Lambda. No, your name. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's do this dot first name equals first name. This dot last name equals last name. See the trend here, right? This dot bio does not equal bio equals an anonymous function. that we're going to return that sentence we copied. You don't need to have bio as an argument. No. So what you can actually do with bio is you can define a function internally inside the function, just called function bio. And then bio will immediately become a property, a part of the prototype. So instead of writing it this way, you could write it this way. And now bio becomes a part of it. If you didn't want to do either of those things, hold on. If you didn't want to do either of those things, you could define it outside, but then you would have to manually bind it to prototype. We will show that, actually, further down. But if you want bio available to person, it has to be attached to it somehow. Somehow you have to attach it. All right, so we have bio as our function. Now just to clean this up a little, just because it's hard to read, I'm just going to put a space between it. So you can see those are my properties. These are my methods, right? Method, not methods. All right, step two, create a new person object using your object constructor. Very easy. So super easy. Go ahead, call your person whatever you want to call your person. I'm going to call mine, let's call it, let's call him Lambda. Why not? We're already halfway there. Equals new. All right, we need that magic keyword. The magic keyword that's going to take our function and transform it into an object. Person, right? And because it's JavaScript, if you did this in any other language, the language would scream at you, right? Unless it was like, say, C++ and you used an overloaded <coughs> method. Um, can you do overloaded methods in Java? It does support them? That's cool. So overloaded method, basically, for those of you that don't really understand what they are, um, you, as long as the parameter list is different, you can call the method the same thing, 
And then when you go to instantiate whatever it is and use that method, it will call the one that's closest to the parameter or the argument list that you provide it. Uh, JavaScript doesn't support that. There's no way to do that in JavaScript. But what it does support <laughs> is if you end this with just a semicolon, it will create a person and it will return it back to you and it will instantiate it with all of those properties in place. But this dot name will be undefined. This dot last name will be undefined. Those won't have definitions yet. So you'll have to go back later and provide them their actual values, right? But it won't blow up. It won't freak out and tell you you didn't, you know, pass the parameter list or something like that. It will just continue on with its merry way. So we're going to use the object constructor because, I mean, why not? We have it. Uh, lambda. It's a good last name for lambda. Callback. Why not? All right. It's lambda callback. Good old lambda callback. All right. Hit execute. If everything's good, it should say passed. And it should spit your bio in the console there. Lambda callback is a mild mannered individual by day. Unless you pass in night. All right. Our person is pretty bland. That's a bold statement. I don't think they're that bland. Just some peep with a first name, last name, and some basic bio. <laughs> I essentially just called Lambda a basic bitch, I guess. <laughs> All right. Just, it'd be nice if we could give our peep some flair. For example, perhaps they're employed, or perhaps they're a student, or perhaps they're a superhero. You can tell by the bio that which direction we're going in here. <laughs> Either way, they need to start out as a simple person. From there, we can broaden who they are through prototypal inheritance. Yes, Tim. Can I just keep the bio again? You certainly can. No worries. Obviously, when we're working with person, person is very generic, right? It's a very, very generic thing. We could go even further up the chain if we wanted to. If we wanted to grandfather the chain more. We could start with mammal, and then from mammal we could go to human, and then from human we could go to... Well, human and person is kind of not much of a reach, right? <laughs> um, but the point is, though, is that from person, person is still very general, right? There are multiple different types of people, not, not just culturally, but also employment-wise, right? Like, some of us are teachers, some of us are students, some of us, you know, have full-time jobs outside of here, like some in the trades, some in programming or the uh, software industry, things like that. There's different things that make us unique, right? Because of that, we can actually take person and break it down into a more unique category if that's what we so choose. So to do that, though, we have to use inheritance because person is where we want to start. We want to start with this generic type and then take its properties and pass those down to more specific types, right? So we can do that now. So... We need to talk about proto before we do that. Every object, and except for the five primitives, everything inside JavaScript is an object, right? Every object has a proto property. We can see that. If you just go to the right-hand side here, uh, let's type in, not window, because we'll be there all day. Let's just type in object itself. Oh, it's all right. In order to spit that out, we're going to need to do dir around it. There we go, because I want this handy little arrow here. It tells me object is a function, because it is when you call it like that. I'm going to open it up. There's all the wonderful properties that are associated with object. But if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll notice this thing called proto. Proto is what allows us to chain inheritance to another object. Basically what proto is, is it's a reference. It's a property reference to what our object is inheriting from. And what do all objects inherit from at the final endpoint? What is it? Exactly, the object base. The object base is exactly what it's going to inherit from. This is where it becomes a little bit like Inception, though, because if I click Proto, I get object. If I click the Proto, oh, this one's not going to do it. Sometimes you'll get another Proto, and it just keeps referring to itself over and over again. But as you can see, from object function to proto, which refers to proto, which refers to the base object, right? So through proto is what creates our chain. 
It creates our inheritance chain, also known as a prototypal chain. Okay? That's what creates our chain from object to object. And that proto, all it's doing is holding a reference to the inherited object. That's all it does. That's its purpose. Okay? It has a little bit of magic to it, though. So, in this particular scenario where we had food, right? And this did happen with our food object. We just didn't really take a very close look at it. But we had food, right? And then we had vegetable, which inherited from food. Right? And then we had celery, which inherited from vegetable. Okay? What happens when I call celery dot set color? Right? What happens is the interpreter looks at the proto method. First, it checks celery to see if the property exists. If the property doesn't exist, then it checks the proto method for a reference object. If there's a reference object in the proto method, which there is, it's vegetable, it's going to use that to connect to vegetable, okay, and say, hey, do you have set color available on you? Interpreter's going to check it. If it doesn't exist, once again, it's going to look at the proto on vegetable and say, are you inheriting from another object? If the answer is yes, I am, it's going to go to that object and ask, do you have set color on you? So the proto is very important because it allows us to be able to create this inheritance chain. It allows us to create this connection between each of the objects. It works because it is the reference to our object. That's essentially what proto is. It's the reference to our object. Now, we don't directly work or interact with proto. There are methods that will interact with proto, but 99.9% .9 of them are deprecated. So I don't recommend using them. They're not necessary anyways because the preferred way of working with this particular thing, if you do need to work with it, is to work with prototype. Prototype is a property that is assigned to instantiated objects that creates that same connection chain for you. Okay? So we aren't going to see prototype on this particular thing, though. We will see it on... We did create a person object. Let's see if we can access our person object so we can see the proto. Uh, what was the name of our person? Lambda. So if we type in M5P7, that'll access my module 5 practice 7 window. I want all the variables that are on it, so I'm going to access .env, that's where I store all the variables from there that get defined. There you can see person, but I actually want to access lambda. There's my lambda, so I'm going to click on it. There's my proto. Where's my prototype? Oh, it's under constructor. There's constructor, and there's the prototype method. So the constructor will hold your prototype method. The constructor is this function, and all of these values are available on that constructor. Don't worry about too much of the in-depth under the engine side to it. Just understand that inheritance is passed through that prototypal chain. Okay? All right, cool. There's a little bit of a description here. Every object has a proto and has most things in JavaScript or objects. You can assume most things have a property called proto. But what is proto? Proto is a property that stores the reference relationship to an object's constructor and properties. And just click execute and you will pass that block. <laughs> if you want, you can go ahead and click the arrows and follow the proto down. String, I believe, goes from string directly to object base. I think number and array do as well. Object as well will also go there and so does function. But if you want something a little bit more unique, let's do uh, document.querySelector. And we'll need to console.log. Dir that, sorry. Yeah. Don't worry about following along. OK. Here's a body element. Click on body. Scroll all the way down to proto. Yes, there's a lot of methods here. There's proto. It's proto, so the thing it's inheriting from is called the HTML body element. HTML body element 
has a proto. Its proto is HTML element. Keep going. Its proto is element. Then node. Then event target. Then object. And we're finally done. It's quite a big chain, right? All of the DOM is like that. All of the DOM has these multiple little inheritance pieces all the way through it that connect back eventually to object. Everything rolls back to object. Cool. So every object inherits from the base object. This may seem odd, but there has to be a start to this object language, and that start is the object base. The object base provides the other objects with the default set of properties, such as constructor, getter, setter, the proto property, and a toString method as well. So every object automatically has a toString method available to it. Prototype. Sounds like a robot horror movie where the robot becomes sentient and murders all the harmless scientists. <coughs> Need to drink less when I make lesson plans. But it isn't prototype. <laughs> uh, prototype is a property automatically given to functions. When you define a new object constructor, you can also define the properties and methods any children objects can inherit. So every one that you create that has this inside your function, when you say this dot first name, this dot last name, children will inherit from that automatically. Okay? If you don't define them with this, they become private to the function. Okay? Uh, any properties defined inside the constructor are immediately added. External ones would have to be added by first accessing the prototype property. So if you want to add them externally, we have to add the prototype property in order to do that. We're going to take a look at that in a second. Uh, and then attaching the new property to it. In short, then, a prototype is a property on a function that points to an object, which we already talked about. So here, you can see there's the function person with a couple of parameters. This is essentially what we just created, right? 42 is a private property. Because we are attaching it directly to the person object, it will not carry through to children. It stays only on the person object. So the rest of the children have no access to it. If the children want access to it, they have to, they have to define the property on the prototype. That's just the way function constructors work. So the meaning of life is on the prototype person.private private property. This now becomes available to any children that inherit. Then we instantiate a new object using the person constructor. So I just create a Sean object. If I console.log name uh, and age, meaning of life, and the private property, um, what do I get for this definition here? What will this return? Undefined. Undefined, exactly, because this is not available to me, it is private. It's private to the person object. However, if I call person.private property, what do I get? 42, because person does have access to its own property set. So it's totally fine. So interestingly enough, if you want to create private properties that don't extend down to the children, that's how you do it. You just call person.whatever the property is, or object.whatever the property is, and define it directly on the object. However, if you want them available to all of the inheritance, then you have to call the, you have to define the property on the prototype. Don't worry, confused faces is totally fine. We're going to do one a little bit further. This one, you just click execute and you'll automatically pass it. That's a gimme. We got a great big long one coming. And then we're done. That's it. Wow, it's a short class. What time do we start at? Six? It's two hours. It's not too bad. All right. So notice that Sean private property returns undefined. That's because unless the property is a part of the original object definition or attached to the prototype property, it is private to the original object. You can use this feature to define private properties on a parent object that shouldn't be inherited by object created using the parent or by new objects inheriting from the, from the parent. Inheritance using object prototypes. We can have one object constructor inherit from another object constructor. Now you're going to want to pay close attention because this syntax can be rather annoying and confusing. And some people prefer the object literal method of inheritance over this type of inheritance because this is a bit confusing. Uh, and by the way, those two are not the only ways to do inheritance in JavaScript. They're just the two most common. There are a lot of ways to do inheritance inside JavaScript. All right. We can have one object constructor inherit from another object constructor. As discussed, an individual person is likely to have more traits 
than afforded by the person object, right? The person is very generic. If we want more specific traits, say our person is a plumber, right? Then we should have a plumber class because not all people are plumbers. Only some people are plumbers, right? Some people might be mathematicians, then we're gonna need a mathematician class. Whatever their particular profession is in this scenario, we would create a class for that particular profession. In order to inherit from our person object, we must instantiate it using the call method. <coughs> this is essentially like calling super in other languages. Do you have super in Java for calling the parent class? Yeah, so in JavaScript, we do have super if you're using ES6 and building with classes using, sorry, ES2015. Um, but if you're not, and you want to do it this way, the prototype way, uh, you will need to use the call method, which is essentially your way of calling super. All right, so this will instantiate the person object and assign its properties automatically to whatever your child object will be, which in our scenario will be superhero. The call method basically allows you to call a function and then pass in a specific value for the this keyword. This, not, not this, like this, this. Remember the magical keyword, this? This is a reference to the owner object, right? Whatever object this is currently called in is what it's referring to at all times. So if you call this in person, what is it referring to? Exactly, it's referring to person. It refers to the object that is encapsulating it which can become difficult with JavaScript when you start getting into lambdas, right? Because this changes context <laughs> the further you go in. Um, and it will bind all the properties of that function to the this owner. So if I call person.call from inside my superhero object, it will take all of the person.call properties that are attached to the prototype and bind them to superhero. So now they become available to it. All right, in order to use all the methods assigned to the person prototype property, we must set a reference to it on our superhero constructor. Um, yada, 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 let's bypass all that and let's just do the actual practice. So I've already copied over person, but make sure that you would click execute on practice seven or person will not be available to you. Cool. Create a new superhero object constructor with the following properties and methods. Connect the superhero object to the person object by calling the person object, add a code name, add a power, add an origin. Okay, let's take it very, very slow. Let's first just create the object constructor. The object constructor we're gonna call superhero. Cool. <coughs> we all know how to create a function. This one just happened to have a capital letter. It's just a naming convention anyways, right? We're going to add one, two, two properties, um, two basic value properties in one method. So the basic value properties will be code name and power. However, slow down. We want to instantiate the person, right? So when you actually inherit from another class, I'm not sure if you know this, but when you instantiate an object, the child, it will call the constructor on the parent, which means we need to have the values that the parent constructor is looking for and pass those to it. And in order to do that, we need to make sure those values are being passed to our superhero, right? So what, what should be our first two parameters? Take a look at our person object. What parameters do I need to create a person? That's right, first name and last name. Okay, and then what two Parameters are unique to my superhero object. Code name and power. That's right. Code name and power. Okay, so then we can go ahead and because person is already assigning its properties, we don't need to do that again. All we need to do is assign the superhero one, so let's do that first. We'll do this dot code name is equal to code name. And this dot last, sorry, this dot power is equal to power. Those properties are now assigned to our superhero object, right? So if we instantiate from our superhero object, totally awesome, those properties will be available to it. In order to get the person object available to us, we will actually need to call it. But before we do that, let's quickly first create the origin function. The origin function is going to be very basic. This origin will equal function let's give function a origin parameter 
And we'll just return origin. I mean, it's almost completely useless, but whatever. It's fine. <coughs> all right. We have our two properties in our superhero. We have all four parameters, two for the person object, two for the superhero object. But you'll notice we haven't done anything to connect the person object to the superhero object yet, right? That will be next. The way we do that is we reference person, the object. We use the method call. The first argument to call is what you want to bind to the keyword this. And we want to bind this, the owner object, superhero. We're binding superhero to this. The next parameters we give it, call is actually going to call the person constructor. So we need to give it two arguments. We need to give it first name and last name. So I'll go over that again. Call will create the new person object and call the object constructor. Okay? Just the same as when you guys instantiate in Java and you're instantiating a child of a parent, it will call the parent constructor. Right? You're doing the same thing here. You're calling the parent constructor. Person is our parent, right? We have to give it a binding. We have to say, you are now bound to superhero. What essentially happens here is this basically connects superhero with the properties and parameters that are sitting inside, sorry, with the properties that are sitting inside the person. It connects them through the prototype. So they become available to it. So we want to actually go over the next piece here. We're almost done. The only problem is, is that this will only copy the properties that are inside the object constructor. If any properties have been defined outside of the object constructor on the prototype method, they won't get copied over. So we need to fix that. And yeah, I know, this is as confusing as it possibly gets. This is like the worst syntax in the world. Hence probably why we have classes now, because classes just look easier. <laughs> but understanding how this works will make you a better JavaScript programmer. Don't ask me how. All right, we need to do superhero.prototype. So we're gonna access the superhero.prototype. And we basically want to take all of the prototypal methods that are currently defined on person and copy them over. So we do equals object dot create. Remember that old fun employee? Create person dot prototype. And what this essentially does is superhero dot prototype now becomes a reference to person dot prototype. That's essentially what's happening. So all the properties inside person, cool. We're now connected up. We did that with this person duck called this first name, last name. We're now connected. We are, we are grouped together. Any prototype methods defined outside of that, we are now hooked up. We've connected those. We're good to go. Person dot call, object dot create for prototype, all set, all glory. Awesome, 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 awesome. All right, let's create a new superhero object using our object constructor. So we've got our wonderful object constructor. We're now gonna create a new superhero. So I'm gonna say let, choose whatever superhero you want. Totally up to you. I'm gonna go with Hulk equals new superhero. And I'm actually going to use the object constructor. So first I need to give the first name, which is Bruce. Last name, which is Banner. Code name, something a little bit for you comic fans, Omega Hulk. For those of you that aren't comic fans, Omega Hulk is the uh, the Hulk that comes out when the Hulk gets mad. So Banner becomes a Hulk when he gets mad. When the Hulk gets mad, Omega Hulk comes out. He's like super like pumped up. But anyways, cool. It's only happened a couple times. Uh, and then what was the last one? I don't even remember my parameter. Power. Power, there we go. Super, super strong. <laughs> All 
All right, step four, console the log, the superhero's origin story. You can literally type whatever you want. It's totally up to you. I'm going to do Hulk equals there. You don't want make Hulk mad. That sounds Hulkish, right? Yeah. Well, he's not notorious for his grammar. <laughs> he just smashes things. Actually, I, I was trying to get my five-year-old to eat mashed potatoes the other day. I told him they're Hulk smashed potatoes. That was pretty witty. <laughs> he still didn't eat them. <laughs> All right, and if everything is connected and golden, and you hit execute, you'll get an error. <laughs> you need to instantiate a new superhero using your superhero object. I thought I did instantiate my new superhero object. It's right here. How could I have done that if I didn't do that? <laughs> Let's make sure I got everything correct. Person.call, this first name, last name, yeah. Superhero equals prototype, object.create person prototype, that's correct. Those pieces are together. I've got my function superhero. I don't think I did that wrong. New superhero is Hulk. Let's just make sure that I've got all those pieces together. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Oh, I've done something. Oh, I see where I went wrong. Do you see where I went wrong? I literally, no, I literally assigned the string you don't want to make Hulk mad to the Hulk object overwriting the Hulk object and turning it into a string literal. Now we need to call the origin. Right? That's what I was trying to do. There we go. Now execute. Awesome. Bruce was splattered with horrific toxic waste and transformed into Omega Hulk. And if you want to spit that out, you'll have to write console log around it. Yeah, why not? Console.log. Boop. There we go. Execute. All right, we have a little bit left. But just before we do that, <coughs> you know what? I want to show you, just quickly, because you guys are so much fun, I want to show you the arrow function. Arrow functions are fantastic. All right, has anybody used an arrow function? Lambdas? Just him. <laughs> All right, I will show you an arrow function. Say I have function to do greeting message console.log message. Bam, right? It's a lot of code. Three lines just to get, like I could move console log up in between the brackets and write it physically on one line. That's totally possible. But there's a much easier way. ES5 created this thing called the arrow function. The arrow function has two cool properties. One, it's extremely shorthand, makes it super fast to write. That's the first one. The second one is how it binds this. So remember how I was talking about um, when you start dealing with callbacks, this loses its context. It's no longer associated with the owner object. As it gets passed through the callbacks, it becomes owned by the callback, and which makes reference very, very difficult, and it can cause issues when you're expecting this to be the owner object, and it's not. Error functions maintain the binding of this to whatever the owner object is. They don't overwrite the context of this. That's the superpower of, of error functions. The cool thing about error functions is just how shorthand they are. If I want to write this particular greeting in an error function, I can do let greeting equal <coughs> oh right of course it doesn't like that I've already done this so I'm gonna have to do that <laughs> there we go I've overwritten my function greeting this is now my function now if I call greeting 
hello world, still works just the way it would if it was a function. So let me break that down for you. Narrow functions in the long form. We need a parameter list, no matter what, and usually they're considered anonymous, but if we don't want it to be anonymous, we will need to set it to a variable. Okay? That's the important part. So we need to give it some sort of name. The cool thing is, is when you're just passing it as a callback, you don't need a name, right? Because it's anonymous anyways. The next thing you need is a parameter list. Even if you don't have a parameter, that's fine. If you don't have a parameter, you can just do the empty parentheses. If you have a parameter, then just put it in. Right? And you can just comma separate your list. Okay? Then, the arrow. The arrow says to the interpreter, this next part is my block. I'm going to take whatever you have done here, and I'm going to pass them into the block and make them available into the block, right? Just like the way parameters work, right? Then you can curly brace it. You can split it to another line. Like so. And then close it out. That's a long form arrow function. Let's shrink this up a bit. I don't need ABC because I only have one message. So I'm going to get rid of that and just do console A, which means I don't need these two parameters, right? I just need A. I'm going to make this a super long arrow function. <laughs> there we go. But because I'm only passing one parameter, I can actually shrink this up even more and lose the parentheses. You can only do that if it's a singular parameter, though. So now I don't need the parameters. Now it's just A being passed into the block. The thing is, I only have one line. I only have one line and I'm returning this. Returning in blocks are automatically implied for arrow functions. So I can actually get rid of this, get rid of this, put it right here. And I'm done. What's even cooler, say I don't want a console log, say I just want to return whatever it is. Maybe A is a value and I want to add it to 5. Whenever they pass, I just want to add it to 5. I can go A plus 5. This is implied return. Implied means as long as there is a singular statement here, this will be automatically returned to whatever is storing it. Okay? So we can write that one as well, just so you can see what I mean. Let greeting, actually I'm just going to make it smaller. Let greet equal m for message. There we go. Cool. Nice and quick, nice and simple. Yeah. So would it not, as far as I'm stupidly aware, should it have returned world because you're not passing anything to add to it? Just... I am passing something to But no, before you actually did your G hello, once you press enter on your enter arrow function, shouldn't it have returned the space in the world because you're adding? It will actually return the function definition because that is a function definition. So this whole piece right here is a function definition. Just the same as if we were to type it out in long form. That would be the long form version of it. That's the short for, uh, form with the arrow function. And you can actually see that. You just type in G and you can see your function definition. That actually gets returned back. Yeah. You're right, though. Intuitively, you would think if it's not being executed, why are you not just returning whatever value it is? But it's because the arrow, the arrow function actually creates a function. Any other questions about the arrow function? No, they will not be on midterms. No, they will not be on finals. No, I will not quiz you on them. And no, I will not mark you against not using them. 
you can earn bonus points, though, for using them. If you use ES5 and ES6 methods and functions and things like that and that syntax, I will give you more marks for embracing JavaScript that much. Okay? Yeah. Do you have multiple uh, lines? Yeah. Um, if you do, though, the problem with the multiple lines is you're going to need... Um, uh, you're going to need to um, do this. <laughs> it, it's still, there's benefits to it because you're still maintaining context of this. So this is the preferred method as of ES5 to write arrow functions over writing standard functions. They prefer this method. Um, um. <laughs> No, it doesn't even take a performance hit because its actual implementation is not a rewritten function. It's a totally new implementation written in C underneath the hood. So no, it doesn't even take a performance hit. In fact, I think they're actually faster performance-wise than over functions, named functions. Yeah. Especially when you're passing them as callbacks. Like, um, we take one, two, three, five, whatever. Reduce, like we showed this a few weeks ago. This is where you like sum all the values inside there, right? And it takes two arguments and everything. It's so much easier just to write A, B, like so, A plus B, nice and quick on one single line when that's all you're doing is writing a sum function. Yeah, makes it nice and clean and easy to see. And because this maintains the context of this, you don't have to worry about the callback now becoming the owner of this and screwing everything up, right? It maintains the context, so it just gets passed through, just like a lambda does, just the way a lambda works. Yeah. All right, let's talk quickly about composition over inheritance and then call it a night. So multiple inheritance isn't supported in every language, JavaScript is being one of them. The idea of multiple inheritance is that you can have multiple, you can have a child extend from multiple parents, right? C++ supports that. Uh, C doesn't have classes, so it doesn't support that. Um, Ruby supports that. I think PHP supports multiple inheritance. Does Java support multiple inheritance? No, it's singular chain, yeah. So that makes sense. So the way around that though, multiple inheritance is not a necessary thing, you don't necessarily need multiple inheritance. There's ways around to get multiple inheritance. You can create what's like a middleware class where it like extends and then everybody extends from the middleware class and it basically will, you build the middleware with all the things it needs and then inherit from the middleware. <coughs> but that gets into, you know, some pretty crazy computer science-y level type stuff. Um, I find composition actually a lot easier to understand versus multiple inheritance. Uh, JavaScript does support multi uh, composition. Every language supports composition. There is not a language out there that does not support composition. You may have to do some funnery in order to get that, but every language supports composition. Um, with PHP, you can use traits. With C++, you can use traits, interfaces, abstract um, classes. In Java, you can use abstract classes. There's a lot of ways to create composition uh, over inheritance if you need to. And a lot of computer... A lot of computer programmers now are actually promoting composition over inheritance, saying that composition is what you should be trying to achieve at all times. I'm of the voice that use the right tool for the right job. That's entirely it. Don't rely on the same structure all the time. Embrace the idea that there's more architectures out there, and sometimes one architecture makes more sense than another architecture, right? You as programmers should always be trying to grow like a balloon, not just stay, you know, on the single path, right? Try to keep growing, understand concepts and structures and data architects and stuff like that over just learning one singular language and procedural programming. Um, composition, simply put, is creating an object that has the exact traits it requires. For example, a person can move and make noise by talking. However, a dog can also move. Wait, can you guys like keep it down just a little bit, please? <laughs> um, a person can move and make noise by talking. However, a dog can also move. But a dog doesn't talk, 
right? So for both of them to inherit move is fine, but for both of them to inherit talking doesn't make sense. Okay, so let's abstract it further. They'll both inherit noise because they both make noise. But that's not entirely true. One is specific. Like talking is a very complicated thing, right? Barking, not so much. Maybe, maybe dogs will argue, right? But barking is not nearly as complicated as talking. So the person needs to be able to move. The person needs to be able to talk. The dog needs to be able to move, but the talk, dog does not need to be able to talk. He needs to be able to bark. So the impl implementation of noise is drastically different as a human has the ability to make millions of noises that form words and sounds, whereas the dog only has a few. So while both a dog could inherit from a parent class like mammal, the implementation would require both creatures to implement a different noise method. This is where composition makes more sense over inheritance. With composition, we can create a trait called talk, and we can create a trait called bark. And then we can create a trait called walk. The human will have the traits talk and walk, so they'll immediately be given that functionality. We literally just give the human the functionality it requires. And the dog will have the traits bark and walk. Our code would still be nicely encapsulated in a modular, but we would be able to efficiently give each creature its specified properties. To sum up the differences, inheritance is when you design your types around what they are. Okay, so a type would be person, a type would be dog, a type would be human. Okay, that's your types, right? Composition is when you design your types around what they do. Does that make sense? So, like I said, a human doesn't need to bark, but a human does need to be able to talk. So it only needs talk and walk, right? Whereas the dog needs walk and then bark. So they only need the traits that they're actually going to use. Again, it's that whole analogy. If you need honey, you don't need the tree, the branch, and the honey comb. You just need the honey, right? There's no reason to have the whole path all the way back to the stupid tree, right? That's the whole point of composition over inheritance. Once again, right tool for the right job. It's not always the answer. Inheritance sometimes does make sense, okay? Um, I will post a link to the fun fun function, if I can say it correctly, where MPJ goes over composition and inheritance and actually walks you through a tutorial on creating a composition. Um, you can take a look at that next week. I will, I'm going to do a little code block where I show you how to actually use composition uh, in a very simplified form, like extremely simplified form, uh, but to give you an idea. All right, go ahead, click that wonderful happy get code button. <coughs> go ahead and copy from the top all the way to the bottom. Make sure you go to the far right as well and hit Command-C or Control-C. Sorry, not all of you are on Max. Control-C or right-click and hit Copy if you're over the age of 65. Then go to Assignments. Go to Labs. Why is the screen so small? There we go. Go to Lab 5. Click Write Submission. Paste that in there. Hit Submit. Collect the points. There is a quiz, and if you didn't do the quiz from last week, do that quiz too. Might as well get them both out right now. Or uh, go ahead and take off, because we're done. <laughs>